Uh, so welcome everyone to this last Cybersecurity Magazine podcast of the year. I'm Philippa Jeffries and I'm here with Hans Christian Rudolph, also from CSM, and James Deacon, Head of Standards and International Engagement for Consumer IoT Security at the Department of Digital, Culture, Media and Sport of the UK Government and member of Etsy's Technical Committee on Cybersecurity. Today we are talking about Etsy's new test specification related to securing IoT, or Internet of Things consumer devices. Um, yeah, what that is and kind of what that means for consumers and others. So welcome everyone. Welcome James. Thank you for joining us. Um, to start with, for those who may not be aware perhaps, uh, James, could you start by explaining a little bit about Etsy and its role in ICT standardization? Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's mm -hmm. lovely to be here. Uh, so Etsy is a standards body that has over 950 members from five continents. So it's industry driven, but it's got stakeholders mm -hmm. or experts from academia, uh, the government, obviously, uh, public organizations and small and large private companies. Uh, Etsy started in telecoms, but mm -hmm. it now creates standards for ICT more broadly. So obviously of relevance here, that's ICT, uh, excuse me, <coughs> that's IoT, mm -hmm. uh, but Etsy standards cover AI, quantum, 5G, broadcast, cyber for enterprises and a host of others. So it's a really broad spectrum of uh, areas within ICT. Okay, and kind of moving on to what we really want to talk about, which is the test specification. But firstly, looking at the um, standard itself, so the Etsy EN 303645 standard, um, can you just summarize quickly kind of what its objective is, what its scope is, and what kind of devices it's looking at? Yeah, of course. So the Etsy EN 303645 is a standard for the cybersecurity of IoT products, as you said. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to establish a security baseline for these products to protect them from uh, common cybersecurity threats. So it's really been designed to prevent large scale uh, prevalent attacks that we see today against these devices. And the products that are in scope are things that we all recognize. So it's uh, connected baby monitors, children's toys, uh, internet connected door locks, smart cameras, TVs, uh, health trackers, really all of the devices that we're all filling our homes with at the moment. And it, it contains a set of uh, security and privacy requirements and recommendations that cover 13 broad categories, uh, in addition to some data protection provisions for users' personal data. Okay, um, and I think this standard has been out for a while, right? It's been um, well well established. Um, what has been uh, published quite recently is the test specification that, that goes along with that standard, right? That, that this uh, TS-103-701. Uh, um, how does that relate to the standard and, and uh, what does that bring in addition to what's already been out there for, for quite a while? So you're completely correct that, yeah, uh, TS-103701 is a, a new release document and it, it's there to describe how a, a conformity assessment can be performed. And that's to give some structure uh, because it allows organizations, whether that's a manufacturer, a, a vendor, uh, to assess the compliance of their devices against Etsy EN 303-645, whether they want to do it in-house as a self-assessment or via a testing lab. And we're seeing uh, multiple public and private sector organizations that are developing certification and labeling schemes for consumer IoT security. So the test specification is really there to accelerate market adoption and to give that consistency of approach. Um, so, I was sorry. gonna say, how wide is market adoption for this? In some ways, it's uh, it's really good. I mean, we've seen from a very low benchmark year on year, we are seeing adoption increase, mm -hmm. but I think there's still a huge amount that can be done to improve it. So we're seeing fantastic work being done globally. Uh, in the end of November, the UK announced they're going to be introducing legislation uh, that will align with Etsy EN 303-645 in some, some areas. We've seen codes of practice from Australia and India earlier this year, and the EU's made announcements. So in some ways, we're seeing a huge... Mm -hmm wall of adoption that's coming uh, and manufacturers are having to adapt to meet that but it's uh, it's still relatively early days i would say right um now you, you mentioned uh, a couple of couple of uh, uh jurisdictions that already adopt these uh, and obviously it's relevant for, for iot developers is it only these uh, stakeholders that that should be aware of the standard for for whom it's relevant or is it also um, other, you know, stakeholders, let's say, um, application developers who, who build on top of these systems um, that these standards um, are aimed at? So there's a range of people that it's relevant for. You're completely right that um, 
TS1037 and 1 is particularly relevant for manufacturers and distributors because they can assess the compliance of their devices against Etsy EM303645. Um, but there are different requirements within, within the standard that are relevant for different roles. So uh, the first security requirement, for example, in the standard is uh, to have no default passwords, and that's most relevant to manufacturers. But the second around uh, having a vulnerability disclosure policy, that's relevant not just to manufacturers, but also mobile app developers as one example. Um, so kind of looking again at the standard, uh, what level assurance would you say that it kind of guarantees? What are the kind of threats that it's defending against and kind of how much can it mitigate those? So the, the standard is looking to prevent every large scale um, attack that we would have seen to date. So that's sort of quite popular or well-known attacks such as the Mirai and more recent botnets. Um, and compliance with the standard restricts the abilities of attackers to control these devices. So if you are a consumer, you know that your devices are protected against the most common attacks and it raises the security baseline from near zero to a, mm -hmm. a good level. Okay. Understand. And, and maybe before we before move on to um, how, how it does that, um, you mentioned before that uh, I think we're talking 13 categories um, in the areas of security and, and privacy. Um, can you mention just, just on a high level, uh, what are some of these categories um, that, that are addressed by the standard? Yes, of course. So there's a range of things uh, that apply to the product. For example, as I mentioned earlier, uh, no default passwords uh, anywhere in the device, but also there's things that organizations need to be doing uh, around how they're protecting the data, how they are, for example, policies they need to have, such as vulnerability disclosure uh, programs and being transparent with uh, the security updates they're going to be providing and the length of time for those. So it, it's quite a holistic thing that looks across the device and the organization as well. Right. So if I understand that correctly, it's not just about how you design and develop um, one of these devices, but also how do you keep it secure throughout the, the whole lifetime of, uh, of, these, of these things. It, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's security by design. And how do you kind of keep that up to date? Because obviously IoT is such a big thing at the moment, but it's constantly developing. And um, as we've like, had 5G and now we're looking at 6G, like how do you make sure that these standards are kind of keeping up to date with the fast development that's happening? It's really difficult. So mm -hmm. there's, the standard is developed to be uh, outcome driven, which I think really helps with ensuring that we're working towards the right goals. Mm -hmm. um, but it's inevitable with an area of technology that is so nascent, such as this. I mean, adoption is increasing year on year. Uh, households are, are really enjoying these devices and wanting to buy more, which is great to see. And as we see that adoption, I think it's inevitable that there will be problems in the future that we can't foresee yet. And as computing power improves, et cetera, there's going to be things that we haven't foreseen. So the standard will need to develop in the future, which we're aware of. Um, and again, it will be having this group of of experts from across the industry. So government, manufacturers, academics who have an interest in this, consumer groups uh, working together to make sure that we are looking at the right areas and, and developing the standard in the future. And as we see that real world adoption, that will help again produce feedback that we can, can action to continue to improve the standard as, the, as mm -hmm. the baseline of security improves. We can lift it further again to make sure consumers are being protected against the next generation of threats. Okay, um, and looking specifically at this standard and this test specification, I uh, just want you to talk a bit about how kind of those developed, who is contributing and how they kind of, you will evolve them moving forward. So there's a, well, an impressive and diverse group of experts who look at this from a range of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So sure. uh, as I said, there's government officials, there's manufacturers from around the world, uh, consumer privacy experts, academics who are all members of the Technical Committee on Cybersecurity, which is the committee that produced this uh, this standard. But it's not just that. Obviously, as we see it adopted by testing houses, as we see accreditation schemes and international adoption, you get feedback from those stakeholders as well. Okay. Um, and we talked a little about kind of the big standards and the manufacturing companies, but your kind of advice perhaps for consumers when buying IoT products? Um, especially as kind of we're coming up to Christmas now, a lot of people are buying this kind of technology. How would you recommend that people kind of check that 
what they're buying meets that security baseline or recommendations for how they can make sure that they do. So at the moment, there's a, a range of schemes that exist to mm -hmm. align with the EN 303645 from groups that we'd recognize such as TUV or the BSI or IOXT amongst many others who can show you that a product meets the security baseline. Um, the most recent bit of news that I'm aware of is at the end of November, uh, TUV SUD uh, awarded their first CSC certification mark to a smart home appliance. So that's the mm -hmm. sort of thing that you can look for and, and gives you some reassurance. But as, as a consumer, there are other things that are in your power. So the UK's National Cybersecurity Centre has published guidance around what you can do with these devices. But hopefully, as we see international adoption of the standard, it will become harder and harder to buy uh, unknowingly okay. a device that is insecure. Okay, but how is that kind of monitored? Because there's lots of products on the market. Like, is it just through kind of promoting the standards and making it kind of a requirement? So that is certainly one aspect of it. It probably won't surprise you given uh, my day job in the government that yeah. I think the governments globally have a huge role to play here because mm -hmm. manufacturers have shown they can meet these standards but it does need in my opinion the regulation behind it to to establish what is the global norm and yeah. a lot of these industries are cost driven for example and therefore uh, it can be difficult to proactively raise the bar of security if your competitors aren't as concerned about mm -hmm. it as you are so anything that establishes I think in law that that requirement is really helpful for consumers as well. And that's actually touching on a, on a very interesting point. Um, coming from a telecommunications background, uh, also in security, I know that uh, across the globe, the, the requirements on, on telecommunications equipment, uh, on the security assurance there um, can be quite mm. different um, and, and varied. And, and I know that there's a huge effort, um, at least, in, in, in 3GPP and, and some of the telecommunication organizations to, to somehow, um, you know, develop a, a sensible security baseline. Do you see a similar issue in IoT where some jurisdictions or some, some national regulators come up with their own schemes and, and how might the standards help um, address some of these uh, challenges? There is a broad international consensus, I would say. So, ETSI EN 303645 has been adopted, although it's had fantastic adoption within Europe and we're seeing particular appetite from the EU to push forward within this area and hopefully be influenced a little bit by EN 303645. The fact that we've seen adoption from Australia, um, well, endorsements from Australia, India, there's work being done in Vietnam that aligns with this, Singapore. It really shows that uh, there is a growing global consensus around what secure, good security looks like, which is fantastic to see. And although I'm sure that in the future we will see slight divergence, perhaps, the fact that we are seeing such a broad spectrum of uh, groups that are aligning on what they think the best case looks like at the moment is, is really positive to see. So at the moment, I think it's positive that we are seeing that widespread acceptance that this is the right, uh, the right route to be following. Okay, that, that sounds promising. Um, so staying, staying on that topic, what is the way forward for, for these two documents, both the, the standard as well as the testing specification um, as, we, as we move ahead? I mean, I'm sure these, these will evolve uh, going forward, but um, can you give us a, an outlook maybe of the, the coming years? Uh, what's the plan for these? So at the moment, we're still producing documents as the TS-103701 shows that are aligned with the current version of EN-303-645. What we will be doing in the future is continuing to produce these documents, but also uh, we're going to, as they get widespread adoption, as we see that uh, baseline of cybersecurity being met for devices, we will want to lift that in the future. So I think we'll see future iterations of this that build on the great work that's been done to date, but also start to look at what uh, the technology of tomorrow looks like but we're still i think this is still incredibly relevant the documentation and although adoption is growing it's still a low uh, percentage of of manufacturers for example that are adopting some of these security requirements there's still a huge amount of work to be done until we have an industry 
more broadly that's uh, meeting the baseline as we see it today. So I think step one is meeting that baseline today and then starting to build on that in the future and ensuring that these documents uh, and the standards stay as relevant as possible and can protect consumers and their devices. Okay, you say there's still kind of a relatively low take up for manufacturers. Um, I just wondering about your thoughts on why that is and kind of what you're doing to really push these standards uh, to the forefront. It's difficult for manufacturers because consumers overwhelmingly assume that the devices they're able to buy are secure. Uh, and therefore, which is understandable, if you're able to buy these things from reputable establishments, you don't expect there to be inherent vulnerabilities in them. But that means that consumers don't necessarily come to manufacturers and highlight proactively that this is a point of differentiation for them. So in that sense, it's understandable that if you are a manufacturer working on a tight margin who's wanting to get your product to market as quickly as possible that you don't feel uh, incentivized to to adopt this but it's also i think on the part of regulators and governments because manufacturers i want clarity they they want to understand mm -hmm. what good looks like and to see that global consensus around that so that they can know that by meeting etsy en303645 that they are meeting good practice as it's widely understood in every corner of the globe so a huge part of it is on governments to, to make explicit what they feel good practice is. And we are starting to see that, which is fantastic. Um, and that helps push them in the right direction. And we are seeing manufacturers proactively adopting these standards now and, and working to meet them, which is great to see. But yes, it's still improving slowly uh, and slower than we would like to see. Okay, I'm interested in kind of your thoughts on this on whose kind of big responsibility it is the security of devices whether it's kind of the regulating bodies whether it's the manufacturers or whether it's the consumers themselves or, or, or everybody a little bit everybody but but to be honest i think we can't expect consumers <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry it's a little bit on everybody but i don't mm -hmm. think we can expect consumers if they want to go out and buy a smart light bulb for example they shouldn't have to have a a working knowledge of cybersecurity in order to know that they are safe in the same way that you can buy a light bulb and not expect it to burst into flames. And that's a mm -hmm. reasonable expectation. You should be able to buy a smart device and not assume that your data or your privacy is at risk. So consumers, of course, do have a role to play in this, but I think it's unfair to put the expectation on them to be experts. Uh, manufacturers need to be they should want to proactively be protecting their consumers. It's a fantastic, um, I think, benefit to a product if you know that it's taking your security seriously. And obviously there's lots of reputable companies that operate in this space who, who want to protect their consumers, for whom that is an important priority. Unfortunately, there's a lot of companies that, that aren't as concerned. And I think that's where governments need to come in and, and have a part to play as well to make clear that, so for the UK legislation, if you don't meet the minimum security, you can't sell the product. It's as simple as that. And I think that is the sort of binary that makes it very clear to manufacturers what they need to do and what the repercussions are for not doing that. So looking ahead a little bit, how do you see um, the, the future of IoT security or developing? Obviously, this is a step in the right direction. It's great to see an uptake in, um, in companies using that and regulators putting that um, into their into their uh, local rules, um, but at the same time, it, it's I sort of get the feeling it sometimes uh, depends on who you ask. Uh, with the connectivity of of five G and and even even more IoT devices coming online, do you have a positive outlook or, or more of a negative outlook with these things becoming even more powerful in terms of computing power and and connectivity? Uh, wh where do you stand on this? What's what's your view of of sort of the coming years. So in some ways I am really optimistic about the future because these products are an incredible force for good when, when used correctly. The fact that vulnerable people can uh, you know, have, have voice controlled lights, for example, is a wonderful bit of empowerment. There's, there's really good things that come from this wave of technology and 5G uh, improved processing power, et cetera, all of these things are combining to allow us to connect devices and, and to really understand things and, and leverage that in a, in a way that wouldn't have been possible just a few years ago. So I'm really optimistic about the future of the sector and the adoption of these products. And my 
my personal hope is that in just a few years time, the idea of being able to go and buy an insecure uh, connected product, and by that I mean one that lacks even basic security, will be as alien to people of the future as the idea today that we can go and buy a light bulb that could just burst into flames without warning from a, from a shop. I think we've seen in the last few years, there's been a huge amount of work being done uh, within the industry. And that I think Etsy deserve a huge amount of credit for the work being done with Etsy EN 303645 in this area to develop that baseline. And we've started to see the, the work being done globally. Uh, so schemes in Australia, Singapore, the UK, uh, Finland, just to name a few. And that's really, I think, in the next couple of years going to start to, we'll see the impact of that. We will see that international adoption. And I'm really optimistic that the wave of good news we've had this year about the adoption uh, and the growing awareness of this, this standard will mean that each year we will now start to see that real snowball of good news, of increasing awareness. And that will mean that consumers can, can, don't need to become experts on cybersecurity in order to just enjoy technology that's being released. Uh, they know that governments and manufacturers and standards organizations have got their best interests at heart and are making sure that security is, is the default. I think we can all agree to that. Um, maybe just um, as, a, as a closing thought, if people, our listeners, want to learn more about uh, either the standard or the, the test specification, uh, where should they go to, to learn more about this? So the Etsy website has a, a great, great range of helpful documents that can give you a little bit of insight into the work that's being done in the technical committee on cybersecurity and also about the standards. You can also read the standards. They are, they are publicly available and they are excellent. Uh, they, are, they are the perfect Christmas gift for, for all loved ones. Um, but uh, yes, also, I mean, social media is obviously a great way of seeing what these organizations are doing, understanding adoption, uh, there's a, a steady stream of positive press releases around Etsy EN 303645 showing where it's being adopted uh, and the global uptake. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, James. It's been really interesting. Um, and yeah, have, have a good end to your year. Thank you very much. Lovely speaking with you. And uh, yeah, hope you have a lovely end to the year as well. Yeah. Thank you all.